Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Park Community Church's live stream of our worship gathering this morning. Uh, this morning, we're going to be doing some uh, Q&A, so we have the opportunity to do that. You can find the information about that at the bottom of the screen. So if you get a question about anything that we have said during uh, our service this morning, feel free to text that number. We'll get your question, and then we'll join a Zoom call together and be able to, to answer some of your questions today. This morning, we're continuing our series in the Gospel of Matthew, Math, Matthew chapter 5. Uh, so if you would, turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to be at verse 7 this morning. So this morning, uh, we're in Matthew chapter 5. It is the Sermon on the Mount. It's what history calls the Sermon on the Mount. And the very first section of Jesus's words in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 uh, are called the Beatitudes. So I know that I cannot hear you. So if you would, please do me a favor. And even if you got to Google Matthew chapter 5 and verse 7, go on and Google it. And, uh, and if you would, when you've got it, shout, I got it. Awesome. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 7 reads this way. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. The very words of Scripture. Amen. It was recently Mother's Day, and this Mother's Day was incredibly unique for me in that uh, my mother passed away at the end of October, and then my grandmother actually passed away just a few weeks ago. So there was a number of emotions that I experienced this Mother's Day uh, that were unique and strange and a whole other host of other uh, emotions. Uh, and yet every Mother's Day, every time Mother's Day rolls around, I, I am reminded of something that happened when I was 10 or 11 years old. 10 getting ready to turn 11, uh, I had actually received a, a basketball goal for my birthday purchased by my mom. And uh, you have to understand something. Basketball in Indiana is a rite of passage. I mean, basketball in Indiana is something that we take seriously. I mean, I, I mean, for those of you, I know you're from Michigan or you're from Illinois, and you think that you take basketball seriously, but in Indiana, we play basketball with a last dance Michael Jordan type of intensity, even if it's horse or even even if it's the game of knockout. And if you're from Michigan or Illinois and don't know what horse is or knockout, you just proved my point. Y'all don't take basketball that seriously. Anyways, I digress. But I had gotten this basketball goal for my 11th birthday, getting ready to turn 11. And it was one of those goals that was adjustable and you would put sand in the, uh, in the tank at the bottom of it or water. And uh, at this particular time, we hadn't put it up yet. It was just uh, stored in our garage. And so uh, in the garage, we lowered the goal down uh, so that it could fit into the garage and the top of the backboard touched the top of the garage. So much so that it actually felt secure if you were to mess with it at all. And so here I am, I'm excited about this new basketball goal. I am fired up about it. My mom's in the garage, she's having a conversation with the neighbor and I keep going up to the basketball goal, hanging on the rim, acting like I'm dunking on it like I am Michael Jordan or Grant Hill in his prime. And so she's having this conversation and I'm running back up to the basketball goal and she would turn over to me and she would say, Steve, stop, stop. You're, you're, you're going to hurt yourself. Stop that. And she's having this conversation and she continually has to turn to me, stop her conversation conversation and say, honey, please, you're going, you're going to do something bad. And eventually, as uh, the neighbor must have been uh, really getting tired of my mom stopping and having to talk to me, and, and, and she must have been thinking to herself, man, this lady does not have a handle on her kid, like he won't obey her. 
And, uh, and so here I am, I am, I'm hanging on the basketball goal, and, and, and you have to understand, we have one car in our family, right? It is, uh, it is a 1989 Nissan Maxima stick shift. And, uh, and, and you also have to understand that that particular car uh, had incredible sentimental value. It, it was my father's car. It was one of those things that just represented him, and he had passed away earlier on in my life. And so this uh, is a special car that's in the garage next to my basketball goal. So here I am, I, I run up to the basketball goal, I start hanging on the rim, and all of a sudden, the basketball goal swings out from under me and comes crashing down on top of the hood of the car. I, I mean, it was so loud, I thought I broke the car. And I was so embarrassed and so ashamed that I, I didn't even wait. I just ran up to my room, uh, ducked my head between my knees, and began to prepare for my punishment. Uh, and so I waited there for a little while, and eventually my mother comes upstairs, and she must have been embarrassed. Uh, she must have been angry and frustrated that I would not listen to her, and, uh, and clearly I had done some dumb things in front of the neighbor. And I, I just remember thinking to myself, here it comes, here it comes. How could you? What were you thinking, Steve? I mean, it's your dad's car. That's it. No more basketball goal. But instead, in the middle of my shame, in the middle of feeling as though I had done something that could never be forgiven. My mom gets down on the ground with me, puts her arms around me, and says to me, it's just a car. It's just a car. Mercy. Mercy. And it was in that moment that my mother taught me a truism of life. It's that sometimes mercy can be more effective or be more powerful in a person's life than punishment. Let me say it again. There are times in life where mercy can be more powerful than punishment. As we get ready to come to our text this morning, uh, our passage is incredibly straightforward. Uh, and so I, I want to preach from the subject this morning, merciful people receive mercy. Merciful people receive mercy. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather together uh, this morning, even virtually online and I pray now as we make our way through this particular beatitude, this particular passage of Scripture, God, that you would stir our affections for Jesus, that Jesus would be exalted and your word would be explained. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. As we get ready to come to our passage this morning, we move to the next set of Beatitudes uh, that Jesus is talking about in Matthew chapter 5. Jesus says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Now, before we jump into our particular Beatitude, I, I want to look again at this idea of being blessed, being blessed. Uh, for many of us, when we think of a person saying uh, that they are blessed, it just connotes the idea that, man, there have been some fortunate things that have happened in my life, and therefore I'm blessed. And yet when Jesus uses the term blessed in our passage this morning, he is communicating much more than that idea of being a fortunate person. 
Uh, He is communicating that these characteristics make up the person who is experiencing the fullest measure of life. In other words, this is the good life. The person who is a part of the kingdom of God and exudes these characteristics get to experience the good life. Or as Jesus says in John 10 and 10, and this is the message translation, and the words will come up on the screen. I came so they can have real and eternal life, more and better than they ever dreamed of. And that that full life is right now and it's coming in the future. But there is a part of it that we get to experience right now. And the other thing about Jesus's use of blessed is that it actually means happy. And that makes a lot of people feel incredibly uncomfortable. And so for many of us, when it comes to being a follower uh, of Jesus, for many of us, we think to ourselves, man, what is the thing that would make me most miserable in my life? What, what is the hardest thing that I could ever do? What, what would bring on the most misery for my life? What's that thing that I'm not good at? That must be the thing that God is calling me to. And there's another group of people that believe that God exists solely for the purpose of bringing them happiness. And so we obey God, that that kind of person obeys God for the sake of what they can get from God. And what we need to see here is that those are two sides of the same coin. What's actually the biblical example of life and life to the full and what God is calling us to is expressed, I think, most clearly in the Westminster Shorter Catechism. It says this and the words will come up on the screen. It says man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Forever. In other words, God's calling on your life and my life is to bring him glory so that when we align our purposes in our desires to God's purposes in God's desires, we actually experience happiness. Not misery. We get to experience the good life. We get to experience joy as we serve God and glorify God in whatever he's gifted us to do. He says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. So it's easy for us to look at these blessings, these eight blessings that Jesus has in Matthew chapter five, and think to ourselves that they are a formula for receiving things from God. But what we've been studying the last few weeks uh, is that these beatitudes are more uh, about characteristics of people who are a part of the kingdom of God. In other words, they are about more about being than they are about doing. These are characteristics that are hallmarks of a person's life who's a part of the kingdom of God. So what is mercy or what does it mean to be merciful? What is mercy or what does it mean to be merciful? I I love what D. Martin Lloyd-Jones says uh, and his seminal work on this particular passage. Uh, He says this about, uh, about mercy. He says, grace is especially associated with people in their sins. Meaning that that particular part of our faith, grace is associated with people in their sins. Mercy is especially associated with people in their misery. He goes on, while grace looks down upon sin as a whole, mercy looks especially upon the miserable consequences of sin. So that mercy really means a sense of pity plus a desire to relieve the suffering. That is the essential meaning, he says, of being merciful. It is pity plus the action. The concern about people's misery leads us to an anxiety to relieve their misery. That that, that is the distinction between grace and mercy. It is it is the, the desire to relieve the misery that someone's disobedience or someone's sin has caused them. 
uh, Bible scholar John Nolan, and if you will, just allow these uh, different uh, commentators on each one of these particular uh, details in this particular passage to kind of be a Lowry seasoning salt to help us uh, marinate and understand mercy a a little bit better. uh, Bible scholar John Nolan says this uh, about mercy from this passage. He says, it allows people to make a fresh start and often involves forgiveness and the release of others from their indebtedness. It is costly in a variety of ways. It allows people to make a fresh start and often involves forgiveness and the release of others from their indebtedness. It is costly in a variety of ways. Jesus says, blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy. Look look with me at that word merciful and mercy. Both of them uh, are in the original language carry with it the same word. The, the New Testament is originally written in a language called Greek and uh, this Greek word for merciful and mercy is the Greek word eleamon, eleamon. It it means to show compassion. It it, it is the ability to sympathize with another, to get inside the skin of another and thus uh, are able to dispense mercy once you experience the experience of another's person. It is to step into the shoes of another. Some of you may know the name Jeffrey Schaumer. He uh, became famous as a journalist during the AIDS uh, epidemic in the 1980s. And uh, he, he was an incredible writer. He was, uh, he was incredibly poignant and compassionate about the things that he wrote, uh, wrote about in the uh, AIDS epidemic, uh, during the AIDS epidemic. And uh, people would wonder, why in the world is Jeffrey Schaumer able to write so much better than anybody else on this particular topic? And so he was asked one day, Jeffrey, it it doesn't make sense. You write so much better than everybody else, so much more poignancy, so much more compassion, so much more clarity than anybody else on the topic of AIDS. Why are you so much better at it than other people? To which he responded, well, I have have a, a kind of better vantage point than other people. He says, I have, I have an unfair advantage than others. You see, because I actually have AIDS. Watch this now. Mercy is the idea of you stepping into the shoes of another. So much so that you take on the experience of another in such compassion that you act in order to relieve their misery. Mercy is to put yourself in the experience of another. I became a follower of Jesus uh, a little under 15 years ago, and, uh, and I, early on, it was like one of those Neo pulled out of the matrix type of experiences, line drawn in the sand. My life was changed. It was an experience. It was different, and I knew that I had been changed, and I understand that that experience is not necessarily the way that everybody's experience of coming to faith in Jesus is like, but that was how it was for me. And early on in my, uh, in my uh, apprenticeship to Jesus, I sensed a call from God to begin to prepare for vocational ministry, to become a pastor. And so I moved to Memphis, Tennessee, and I was a part of a great church there. I was a pastoral apprentice uh, at that church, and I was going to seminary, which is a uh, basically grad school for pastors. And, uh, and so I'm in seminary. I'm at the church. I'm a fly on the wall for a lot of incredible conversations. I get to do all the stuff the pastors don't want to do, and I'm just around. And my friends would tell you, uh, early on in my Christian journey, and really still to this day, I have a sensitive conscience about certain things. 
And other things I, I'm not that sensitive about, but certain things I have a sensitive conscience about. And in that particular time period in, uh, in my life, about 10 years ago, I had a pseudo, uh, uh, sort of pseudo, um, uh, a, a, a pseudo perfectionist view of uh, being a follower of Jesus, meaning that I could arrive at a, a certain level in my own effort with God. And, and so I would never say that out loud, but that's the way that I thought in my heart. And so I was loving my time as an apprentice, loving my time in seminary. I had a great time, but then I messed up. I mean, big time. Uh, I, I messed up, and it was one of those situations like David in Psalm 32 where, uh, man, I kept quiet and my bones wasted away on the inside, right? Right. And so here I am, this young budding pastor. Uh, I, I've done something, uh, something wrong, and I, I make up in my mind, like, man, I gotta confess this. And so I, I've I've got a meeting later on with uh, Pastor Ricky, who was my supervisor at the time at the church. And I sit down with Pastor Ricky, and you have to understand the days leading up to this meeting. I thought to myself, man, uh, man, this is it. I better get my, my bags packed. I started to hear boys to men in the background. This is the end of the road. I said, this is, this is it. I'm never going to have another day uh, in ministry again. And I, I've, I've disqualified myself. And, and so I, I sit in this seat. And as Pastor Ricky begins his opening uh, sort of remarks of the meeting, uh, I say to him, uh, Ricky, I, I need you to stop. I need to tell you something. I, I've done this wrong. And it was as though in this sort of 10 minute span of time, it was as though Ricky metaphorically stepped from his side of the table, sat in my chair and my shoes, identified with my failure And he said, I understand. I forgive you. Go and sin no more. And it was in that 15 minute or so span of time that I realized two things. The first thing is that I realized that I was attempting to stand in my own righteousness to keep the qualifications of a pastor in my own righteousness and not in Jesus' righteousness. And that in and of itself was rebellion against God. That was my fundamental problem. And secondly, I was reminded of the day I pulled the basketball goal down on my father's car. I was reminded that there are going to be times in life when mercy is more powerful than punishment. There are going to be times in life when mercy is more powerful than punishment. You see, right now in our particular day and age, we live in a society where even the insinuation of wrongdoing from uh, from other things brings outrage. Uh, we, we hear somebody say this over there and we're outraged about that and somebody did this over here and, and we're outraged about that. If somebody says there's the possibility of wrongdoing, we write people off uh, and, and we just press cancel, unsubscribe, block, unfollow, and, and there's a word for it. There's a word for it in popular culture. It's actually called cancel culture. Now, I'm not talking about things that people uh, won't own up to, and I'm not talking about things people habitually do with no remorse. And in many many ways, in our uh, uh, 
our, our pursuit of progress in our society uh, in this sort of century, in this time period of our lives in America, uh, you know, we have allowed people to have voices who traditionally haven't had voices. And it's been an incredibly good thing for our progress in society. It, is, uh, it has been a part of bringing justice or bringing righteousness to the earth that we allow for all voices to be heard. But this is what happens in our society. This is what happens in our culture. We want the benefits of the kingdom of God without submitting ourselves to the kingship of Jesus. And so we we take the principles and the morality of the kingdom of God to say that all voices matter and people should be represented, and we take it to the extreme. And now anytime some uh, troll Twitter bot on Twitter uh, gets on and says, uh, uh, makes an accusation about somebody 10, 20, 25 years ago, we, we all of a sudden give validity to it and say, cancel them. No more. Cancel. Cancel culture. You see, we don't give people a chance for redemption. The world keeps throwing people's failures back at them 10, 20 years down the line back in their face, but I am so glad. I am, I am so glad. I, I don't know about you, but I am so glad that the author of life doesn't cancel me when I do wrong. I, I am so glad that the maker of heaven and earth didn't listen to the accusations of Satan against me, but he stepped into my shoes and, and cried out from the cross, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. Father, have mercy on them for they know not what they're doing. I'm so glad Jesus didn't press the cancel button on me. Oh, I wish I had a witness who could testify right there in the comment section. Oh, yeah, that's me. Mercy suits my case. I know that's right. Jesus is somebody who won't cancel me, who won't hang up on me, who won't leave me when I do wrong. But mercy suits my case. I'm so glad Jesus doesn't cancel us. Okay, Steve. Oh, oh, okay. I agree, cancel culture uh, isn't the way followers of Jesus should be. That's not the way followers of Jesus should roll. But but maybe that's just for people who aren't followers of Jesus yet. That's that's a great question. I understand that. But let's let's check Jesus' receipts on on that question, that, that mercy is really for people who aren't followers of Jesus yet. In Matthew 26, uh, Jesus says to Peter, the apostle Peter, uh, he says uh, to him, Peter, by the end of the night, you're going to deny me three times. Later on in Matthew 26, in in the later portions of our our book that we're in right now, uh, Peter does deny him three times. When he was first told that he would deny him three times, Peter said, oh, no way. You're, you are crazy. I will never deny you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I'm a, an, an apprentice. I'm a disciple. I'm an apostle of you, Jesus. This Peter is the guy upon whom Jesus says, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. Peter, you are going to be the vestment and the rock upon which the church spreads throughout the known world. And yet the beauty of the gospel storyline is that Jesus doesn't give up on Peter even when Peter gives up on Jesus. Oh, I'm so glad Jesus doesn't press the cancel button on us. I'm I'm so glad uh, mercy suits our case and he extends it to us. And and so somebody else might say, but yeah, okay, okay, it is for followers uh, of of Jesus. But but what about, uh, you know, certain sins? Steve, what, what about certain things uh, that, that we can do and, and, and certain things that maybe we shouldn't be able to receive mercy from? It's a good question. In John chapter 8, there's a story of a group of religious leaders who brought to Jesus a woman, the Bible says, who had been caught in the act of adultery. 
Uh, Now, hear this. She didn't come to Jesus and say, Jesus, I'm so sorry. I've done something wrong. Will you forgive me? She didn't, uh, she didn't, uh, she didn't come to the religious leaders and say, hey, it's me. I know. I know I messed up. No, the Bible says that she was caught in the act. And so the religious leaders come up to Jesus and, and they say, the law says, Jesus, that you are to stone her. What do you say? And the Bible says that Jesus bent down and he began uh, to write in the sand. He's writing in the sand and he's, he's writing in the sand. And, uh, and, and many biblical scholars, uh, they, they, uh, they, they, think that they, they, they think that there's the possibility that Jesus may have been writing these religious leaders' sins in the sand. And so by the time he gets done writing, Jesus looks up and he says to the woman, do you have no accusers? She says, no. Is there no one to condemn you? She says, none, Jesus. He says, well, neither do I. Go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. And you see, the reason Jesus can do this is because he came to perform the greatest act of mercy in human history. He came as the one offended by our sin and by your sin and my sin, and he acted to relieve the misery of it. He he took on the misery of sin on the cross, and he extends that mercy to everyone who would cling to him as the object of mercy. And somebody, you may be listening to me today, and you're not a follower of Jesus, and and the reality is there's some some things that you've done in your life, and you say God could never forgive me for that. There are some, the, some things that, that you've done in, in your life and you can't, even, uh, you can't even forget, you don't feel like you can forgive yourself for that. And hear the message of Jesus Christ. Jesus stepped in as your representative. Just as pa- Pastor Ricky metaphorically got out of his seat and sat in mine lived the perfect life that you could not live, and died sacrificially, taking on all of the sin that causes you your misery. If you would just cling to what he accomplished for you by trusting in the sacrificial death, in the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you see, As we follow Jesus, the command for us is to become like him as people who are characterized by mercy. And and if we ever fail to extend mercy, what that really means is that we fail to recognize the first four Beatitudes. We're not poor in spirit because we really think that we have some kind of spiritual merit. If, if we're not able to extend mercy to other people, we actually think that we can stand in our own merit. And if we're not merciful people, we're, uh, we're not hungering and thirsting for righteousness because we think that, that we actually have some kind of righteousness of our own. And we just become just like the religious leaders who brought the woman caught in adultery to Jesus, completely blind to our own spiritual bankruptcy. We all need mercy, not just to begin. We need mercy to continue on to the end. Here I am. I'm at your neighborhood. I've pulled up. You're grilling burgers in the courtyard of your apartment complex. We're practicing social distancing. I'm sipping slow on a white claw. I mean a watermelon Waterloo. And here's my question to you. Who do you need to show mercy to?
I want to say a word to that parent, that toddler that you've got in your arms right now. That toddler is going to have their very own basketball goal pulled down on top of the car experience. That toddler in your life is going to grow up and they're going to get older and they're going to make a mistake. And you're going to have to make the decision mercy or punishment. Mercy. And if your parenting has not been characterized by mercy, if they, they live their lives in such a way that says, man, I've got to be perfect in all of these different areas. And if I mess up, then, man, my parents are really going to be disappointed in me. And they're going, uh, they're, they're, they're going to kind of cast me out until I get my, my stuff together. Then they're not actually experiencing the gospel of Jesus. No, they're just experiencing everything else the world throws at them. Performance gains me acceptance. And yet the beauty of the gospel and what you get to do as a parent is to say your performance is not why I love you. I love you because you're my child. That's the gospel. That toddler is going to grow up, and they're going to come home with a bad grade. They're going to come home with a suspension from school. I know that sweet little baby that you're holding in your arms right now, you think they could never do anything wrong. They're they're going to come home with a bad ACT score. They're going to have a run-in with the police. They're going to get some girl pregnant. They're going to get pregnant. And don't even let me fill in the blanks for you. What What is that one thing what is that one thing that, that, that you know you as a parent would be incredibly embarrassed by? Got it? That thing. You'll have a decision to make. Mercy or punishment. For those adults who are listening to me right now, who have parents, your guardian, your mom or dad may have done something a long time ago and they owned it. They came to you and they recognized, I messed up, I apologize, I need your forgiveness. And you've been holding on to bitterness year after year after year after year. And maybe the thing that you need to do today is get on the phone and as an act of mercy, relieve them of their misery. Hey, I just want you to know it. I appreciate you saying that. I acknowledge that that I've heard what you had to say. We don't got to be best friends today. I don't have to call you every day, but I want to move forward. Can we move forward together? Mercy. You see, and and, and you can do that because Jesus has done that for you. If you are a part of the kingdom of God, you are characterized as a merciful person. Let me say to that leader in the marketplace who has people who are 
uh, working underneath them, who have uh, people who, are, uh, who, who they're managing. I understand that the culture says cancel people, get rid of them when they don't do what they're supposed to do. And, and I know that the reality is there's going to be times when you have to fire people. There are going to be times when the reality of uh, the people who you have on your team, they're just not a good fit. And you may be keeping them from something that God has for them to do by trying to make it continue to work. And yet the reality is, if you are a follower of Jesus, a part of the kingdom of God, you cannot be characterized by cancel culture. You must be a person of mercy. Finally, to the church. I want to say to every church member, every church leader, every future elder, every future pastor, it is a travesty that the evangelical church in America is not known for mercy. I was reminded earlier this week as my mentor uh, responded to the death of one of his friends. He said, he said, I am so glad that Jesus wasn't an evangelical Christian in America. I- I'm so glad that Jesus wasn't an evangelical Christian because if Jesus was an evangelical Christian, then Peter would have never made it to preach at Pentecost. Let that set in for a second. If Jesus was an evangelical Christian, Peter would have never made it to preach at Pentecost. And so I want to say to you, church member, keep us accountable. Keep me accountable. Keep the leadership accountable. Is this a place of mercy? I want to say to every future elder, every future pastor, every person preparing for vocational ministry, before you put together your obstacle course of restoration, remember that our God is characterized by mercy to step into the shoes of another and relieve their misery. So hear these words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy.